Uh, Sandra Jones's great grandbaby, her grand great granddaughter, had her implants put in. And as I kind of anticipated, she was going to heal quicker than the adults thought she would. Uh, they are going to turn those on the 12th of October. And uh, she's, they're trying to figure out a way to put it on uh, FaceTime. That's the Apple version or the iPhone version of, of Skype on, on, or Google Meets or Zoom on Android. And so... So they're trying to figure out a way to do that. Hi, Jackie. And um, so uh, uh, they, um, uh, Curtis, the dad, is is um, uh, reporting some pretty good news on that that front. I didn't hear any more about Juanita Bates. She got her hand stuck in her trunk uh, accidentally and somehow another smashed up her hand. Uh, but I guess no news is good news. So, and um that's all the no that I is the no. So uh, uh, anyhow, uh, with that being said, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day in which you blessed us with. Thank you for the moisture you've chosen again to give us this thirsty land. And, and Father, we it's kind of a nice problem to complain about, even though we shouldn't be complaining about all the weeds and all the ex extra things that we complained about not having. And Father, we just thank you that you have blessed us so far with so many things that you have entrusted to us and with us. And Father, we pray that you'll forgive us when we haven't always been to the best of our trust. Father, we thank you for the trust that we have in your word. We thank you it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We thank you that it is the, that we have been entrusted with several copies in this world. And Father, we just pray that we use the word wisely. We pray that we will handle your word correctly tonight and in all future endeavors. Because Father, we want to know. We want to know about you, what you have revealed. And we want to know about your son, what, what he has done, what he continues to do, and what you continue to do, and the Holy Spirit as well. Father, help us not to fall for Satan and his devices because he is always firing, firing those darts. So please forgive us of our sins when we failed you. Thank you for Jesus who has made the forgiveness of sins a reality. If we will turn to you and ask you to forgive us and confess those things. It is in and through the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. As we wrap this up, the one thing we want to emphasize is what these people are teaching. There are still two groups that are still teaching some things that are not true, and yet they are so easy to fall for. The docetists are your majority. And what they are simply saying is that there is no way that, the, that Jesus the Christ existed. There is no way Jesus the Christ existed. In fact, they will go so far as to say that since all flesh is evil and these people have given this ridiculous story about a, about a perfect man, that he's got to be a spook. That he has to be a spook. He's got to be a ghost. Uh, I, I find fascinating that scientists have proven time and time and time and time again that there's no such thing as ghosts, that what Scooby-Doo taught us is absolutely true. But you tell this to kids and they will call you a liar. They will say things like, well, now, wait a minute. I was in this school building and I, I will tell you, I saw something move and, and adults will do that. I tell them I've been in that school building at 10, 30, 11 at night, one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning when somebody's broke into the place and I haven't seen a thing. I haven't heard a thing. One night on brain games, they took a and did a study. They took a Ouija board and this Ouija board, when they did this, they were, oh, it was indicating stuff that these people knew. And they went and blindfolded them. 
And when they blindfolded them, the, the Ouija board's here, and it was going off this way, and this way, and this way, and this way. And they said, you didn't show us anything. Oh, no, 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 you made all that up. They went and showed them the video. You doctored the video. They said, you want us to do it again? Yeah. They went through the whole thing. Guess what? Same thing happened. The only way ghosts exist are when we want them to exist. And, and that's been proven time and time again. Now, do I, do I fault anybody for telling ghost stories? Are you kidding? That's one of my favorite things to hear especially when I was a kid and I'd hear the old timers and they'd tell these super dino whopper tales as Jerry Clower would call it. But that's all they were. It's fun to hear. No truth in it. But what Jesus was supposed to be was a spook. And John says, he's not a spook. Now the centrist on the other hand said, wait a minute. Can't happen. That can't, that can't be true completely. So there was a temporary existence with Jesus and the Christ. The Christ being the son of God, Jesus being the human being. I mean, you can't say that he wasn't the son of God by turning around and saying, well, no, wait a minute. He, he's evil, but he look at the things that he did. I mean, he, he healed people. He cause a blind man to see incidentally can you imagine what the news would be saying today if they had videoed what if they had promoted or had shown a live video of when jesus spit in the in that dirt and put it on that man's eyes you imagine what people would be saying but he healed the guy with this born with blindness or had blindness for 38 years, sorry. Well, both. Then you got another one who's who he just speaks. So there's no way he couldn't be the Christ. But the only time that happened was when he was baptized. You remember, remember in your own Bibles, it says in Matthew 3, the spirit descended upon him like a dove. That's the only time you'll see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then what, what did he say? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And so the Christ and Jesus, yeah, when he got baptized, that's when he got cleansed. That's when he fled. That's when Jesus got cleansed. So he could enter Jesus. And he did that for about three years. And then when he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, that's when God took the Christ out of Jesus. And the man that went to the cross is not the son of God. This, this idea of Hui Malui, that one man died for the world, is just that. Well, you and I know better. And what John's going to do, what I want to go back and do just for a few minutes tonight, is I want you to notice how many times the word no is in in this book not in the bible but no 33 times the word k-n-o-w the base word for gnosis the base word for gnosticism is found in the new king james version the 32 times in the niv the new, new international version in the new american standard bible so if you do the math, you're looking at about six times per chapter. Six times per chapter, what you should know and what you do know. I gave tests today of the 50 states and 50 capitals. My kids have had this information for three weeks. We have done repetition, repetition, repetition. The kids have gotten mad at me because I wanted them to do it again and again and again and again and again. Then they told me today I never have told them about the 50 states and the 50 capitals. Mm -hmm. Then they told me 
They didn't know there was a test today. <clears throat> then they told me that they didn't know how they were going to do this because they didn't know the information. Well, imagine being a Christian, never studying the book, and never knowing the things that you and I can know and should know and do know. And this is why I tell people all the time, I told somebody this morning, I don't trust my feelings. Sometimes I go with them, but I don't trust them. Because what I know is always correct. As long as it's according to the book, it's what I'm talking about here, as what I know. So for example, 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if we, haven't, if we have sinned, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I mean, that's what we know. Go up to, to chapter 2 and verse 3. By this we know him if we keep his commandments. 1 John 2, 4. Anyone who says I know him and does not keep his work commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, let's see if I can move that a little bit. 1 John 2, 4, 2, 5. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. 1 John 2, 11. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going. Because the darkness has blinded his eyes. First John 2, 14, I've written to you fathers because you've known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. First John 2, 18, little children, it's the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming and even now many Antichrists have come by which we know it's the last hour. 1 John 2, 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. 1 John 2, 21, I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. 1 John 2, 29, if you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Verse 2, beloved, now we are children of God, and it's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know when he is revealed, we'll be like him, for we'll see him just as he is. First John 3, 5, and you know. He was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. First John 3, 6. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. 1 John 3, 15. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 1 John 3, 16. By this we know love because he's laid down his life for us. And we also laid down, have to lay down our lives for the brethren. First, first John 3, 19. And by this we know that we're of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our, First John 3, 20. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. First John 3, 24. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he's given to us. First John 4, 2, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. First John 4, 6, we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who does not of God does not hear us. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. First John 4, 7 and 8, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. First John 4, 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. First John 4, 16, and we've known him and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. 
1 John 5, 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. 1 John 5, 13, these things I've written to you that you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So now we come to the last part of the study and he's going to take that word know, K-N-O-W, the root word of Gnostic, of Gnosis, the root word of Gnosticism, and he's going to attack again what these people are teaching. What he says, first of all, is we've got confidence. We know. I mean, I, I have people from time to time, they'll ask me about something. Uh, they'll say um, something along the lines that, about maybe one of my brothers and, and and they'll say well do they get mad somebody says well i think they do i tell them no 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 they do get mad i know they get mad but i get mad too everybody else does too and i know what will take tick them off i know what will make them upset and they know what will make me upset because you see when we know God, John 17, 3 says that's eternal life. Paul said it another way in first in Second Thessalonians chapter 1 in verse 8, to take vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is imperative that we know God. I, I just know things about my family that you don't, you know things about your family. We know things about God. For example, you know somebody's lying to you when they tell you God will not send anybody to hell. Well, that's partly true. God's not going to send people to hell. It's going to be what they've, what they've earned, what they've what they've been rewarded with because they made a choice. It's going to be the end of their choice. Now, does that ultimately come under God's power? You better believe it. Nobody thought Jesus was ever going to run the money changers out. But we know why he ran the money changers out because my house has become a den of what? Thieves. You don't change God's house to a den of thieves when it's been, when it's been dedicated there. You don't do that. So what people do then is they punish God with the first bullet. And what they do are first two bullets. And what they do is they misunderstand immediately because what they read is what they want to read. I did for years. I'm telling you from experience. Now, I know this. I don't try to offend people with this illustration, but people just inevitably talk about that. You know, I asked God for that $1.335 billion lottery. And I'm a Christian, and the Bible says whatever we ask, God has promised to give it to us. That's what the Bible teaches. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. The first thing John says in verse 14 is, we ask, he hears. We ask, he hears. One of the great ironies of life is, and Adele and I talk about this frequently, we don't mind when our cat ignores us. We think that's the funniest, one of the funniest things in the world. But if my kids ignore me, there's two things I don't like. I tell, tell even my school kids, you will not lie to me and you will not ignore me. I will get your attention one way or another. And they'll, okay. <laughs> don't you love being ignored? Don't you just love it? Don't you just appreciate being ignored? Yes, no, okay, I just want to make sure I was <laughs> making sense. Nobody likes to be ignored. Nobody likes to be disrespected. But for some reason, people have read into this text something it didn't say. 
But what do we know? We know when we ask, God hears. Does that say in that text that he's going to give us whatever we want? The answer is no. <laughs> it never said that. You know how many people I've heard say that to me? You know how many people, or you know how many times I thought it said that? Until I went and read it. Oh, what a concept. <laughs> we ask, he hears. Well, I, I, I know what you're reading there, preach, and you know, I know what you uh, are saying. But, you know, biggest waste of time in my life is prayer. Well, why do you think the biggest waste in your life is prayer? Well, I'm just talking to air. That's what Chuck Swindoll said. Uh, you know, I, I, I talk and, and I don't hear anything. And then I asked them, what would you do if you did? And they went, what? I said, what would you do if you were praying and you actually heard God say, hello? Well, you'd freak out. <laughs> you'd quit praying. I don't mean that God is dead here. I'm not saying that God doesn't speak through his word. But many of people have fallen for the idea that prayer is a waste of time and or prayer doesn't work. He hears us. My granny excelled at this point. I can still see her laying back on that wedge pillow, listening to her grandson, me, gripe and complain and gripe and complain about life. And I can see her sometimes. She'd do this and she just sat there and sat there and sat there. And then one time, when I got a little bit older, I went, you know what? You helped me solve my own problem. And she goes, I did. <laughs> One of the reasons I love that woman so much. Because she just excelled at this idea of hearing, listening. She knew you didn't necessarily want to agree with you. But she sure wanted you to listen. I tell people this all the time in school and when I was an administrator. Listen, people don't expect you to agree with them. People don't expect you to give them what they want. But by dinghies, they expect you to listen. They expect you to sit there and listen to what they have to say. I'd have a parent come in and they'd be all bent out of shape. And I said, well, what are you upset about? Well, you know. Know what? And they'd go, well, you know what's going on. I ain't got a clue. And they'd go 30 seconds into this conversation. I'd be writing notes down. They go, you really don't know, do you? No. And I'd have the situation solved within two hours. And the parent would be like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But you got to hear. What do we tend to want to do? James says we want to tend to do the opposite. James 1, 19 and 20. When he says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. We want it the other way around. We want to be quick to wrath, quick to speaking, and slow to hearing. I don't know about you. It didn't surprise me a bit, the statistic that we got today. We are the fifth most popular state in the country for road rage. Didn't surprise me a bit. Didn't surprise me a bit. You know how many people have tried to beat me up because of something I did? Crazy. God hears. That does not mean God said yes. But he did hear, and he never ignores us. That's what John says. He never ignores us. Now, he might not say yes. And thank God he said no to me many a times. Thank God he said to me, no, wait a while, Dwayne. My timing's better than yours. But he's never, ever ignored me. I, I think about, and I know I'm not trying to diminish God. 
but I think about the movie Bruce Almighty when Jim Carrey is there and you know uh, Morgan Freeman's trying to convince him he's God and he, he's got this little file cabinet and he said the, your file's in there he said look at the second drawer and all of a sudden well you mean that's all the things I've ever done Freeman says open it and all of a sudden it starts carrying him as far as you can see. And then all the all the petitions people are making and he's going, shut up, shut up, shut up. Then he decides to do an email thing. Well, the email is <laughs> as as long as the as the request by by voice. But our God hears every one of ours. You know Jim Carrey playing the part, missed uh, missed some. He missed some things, and yet we tend to get in a hurry. And if you don't come counsel me, I tend to get in a hurry. I tend to get in a hurry about you know God. Maybe can you speed this up a little? Uh, can you can you fix this a little bit? Can you go a little faster? And then when it goes too fast, God, can you slow down? Can you slow down? We ask. He hears. And he doesn't ignore our petitions. In fact, Revelation 8, 1 describes heaven as chaos. It is so chaotic. There's noises and thunderings and lightnings and flashes and, and I mean, all kinds of things going on. But you know what stopped it for 30 minutes? Don't ask me why 30 minutes. I don't know. You know what stopped it for 30 minutes? The incense made. What's the incense made? The prayers of the saints. Now, these Gnostics said, prayer? No, 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 no. Prayer doesn't. No, that, that's silly. God's not interested in listening to us. But what he will do is he, he does want to hear us just asking for things. He didn't want us to be grateful. He didn't want us, but he, he's just interested in, and he doesn't want any praise for sure. And so how you know much better you are to God is how much you know. John says no. Because that's the life leading to death. John says there is a life that is leading to death. He calls it a sin. And there's one that doesn't lead to death. Well, we know what he's talking about here, right? The life that's leading to death is the one that's never dedicated itself to God or has left God. And that's why John says when people get to a point as Floyd and I talked about one time, you know, there are some people that get to the point where they are never going to do what, what they should do. They have got such a hard, stubborn heart that they're never going to do this. Now, I still argue that there's a glimmer of hope because there's always hope. But you know of people that I'm talking about that just, no. Nope. Well, I, I know I know what you're saying is right. Everything you said in the scripture is right, preach. But you know what? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to do it. And you ask them why. And they always avoid you. I had a lady one time and said, I just can't worship the way you worship. And I said, well, explain it to me. Nope, I don't want to talk about it. And still to this day, I have no idea what she's talking about. Thought the world of the woman still do because see non-christians are living their life of death christians are living life and so when he says there's a sin leading to death there are christian people who have fallen away that we need to pray for there are christians that we still need to pray for that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing and so they're part of that erring group but there are people who are just never going to do what needs to be done. And Paul said that in Romans 6, 16 through 18. But God be thanked 
that you obeyed from the heart that gospel, because what are we? We're slaves either way. I know that bursts our bubble living in the United States, but we are slaves either way. Because we're either going to present ourselves as slave of, of disobedience to the devil, or we're going to present ourselves slaves of righteousness to God. And I know which one I'd rather have as a master, or who I'd rather have as a master. I'd much rather have this master here. I'd rather have righteousness. I'd rather be with God. So, God has made us, as we call it, free moral agents. He's given us the ability to choose, but we're going to pay for all our choices. I, I cringe when I hear politicians over this abortion issue, and they're really piling it on because it worked in Kansas, that a woman has the right to her own body. You, you go by my house and you'll hear me say, whose body is it? Whose body is it? It's not yours. Mine's not mine. Whose is it? It's God's. That's God's. Can you imagine? If, if people took the logic they did today and, and told Mary what she should have done, we, there is a possibility that we wouldn't have Jesus. Possibility. Because what she should have done is aborted the child. We just talk about murder and just, I mean, I heard a Christian not long, not long ago say, well, I tried to get her to have an abortion. And I went, what? Well, what do you mean? There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, my goodness gracious. Well, that's another subject. but. There is a sin leading to death and one leading to unrighteousness. So now what he says is what we know is the true and the false. Got a 50-50 shot at this, right? In other words, you can't be in the middle. You've got to know true and you've got to know falsehood. So what does it say? We know, first of all, that whoever is begotten of God, the better words begotten, does not sin. Now. Let's stop here. Go back to the context. The idea of does not sin is the Greek here is doesn't live the life of sin. Doesn't live apart from God. Doesn't mean you're not going to sin. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to burst your bubble here tonight. But I blew it yesterday. I blew it yesterday. And I let old Satan sneak in and talk me into things that shouldn't have happened. And I messed up. And I talked to the Lord about it this morning. And he's like, could have told you that was going to happen. <laughs> he didn't say that, but I was not like it here in my head. Let's see. What is the Holy Spirit still doing? Acts 26, 18. He's still convicting of sin. Did I know what I did was wrong while I was doing it? Yeah. Did I still do it anyway? Unfortunately. Just, and that made me even more upset than what I was upset about. <laughs> but watch what he says. But he who has been begotten of God keeps himself. Now, can you keep yourself? The answer is no. So how are you going to keep yourself? What does he say in Ephesians 6? Be strong in the Lord and the power of whose might? His might. Well, that's kind of tough, isn't it, when we want to do what we want to do? And the wicked one doesn't touch him. Oh, I didn't keep myself yesterday. I'm ashamed of this. But I'm confessing tonight. I didn't keep myself. I didn't keep myself. I let him sneak in on me. So number two, we know that we're of God. We know we're of God. I, I don't know if you know this, but let me tell you, there are some Christians that don't know if they're of God or not. I didn't for a long time. Well, I can tell you all the facts. Did I obey the gospel? 
You bet. Did I, was I baptized into Christ? You bet. Was I raised to walk that new life? Yes. Did I walk that new life? I mean, it wasn't two hours after I walked that new life. I did something I shouldn't do. And I went, I got to start paying attention to what I'm doing here. And did I, did I know what was right? Yeah, I, I did it. My dad told me, and I, I still remember his words. He said, Dwayne, there's not a thing I can't tell you that you don't already know. There's not a thing I can't tell you, you already know. And in the coldest water I've ever been in in my life, I did it and I have not regretted it. I didn't even regret getting in cold water. It was even colder than that lady we baptized a few years ago where the hot water heater was out. And every time she stepped down, oh, oh. So why am I sitting here tonight saying I wasn't sure? because I let somebody try to talk me into a glimmer of doubt. Am I perfect? Oh no. I wished I were. I'd still need Jesus, but I still would love to be perfect, but I'm not. We know we're of God. You see, the Gnostics were telling you, no, you, you're not of God. No, 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 no. You're not of God. What is this business about this man named Jesus? That if all flesh is inherently evil, then hey, you can't, you can't have a Jesus, a, the Christ. But how much of the world is lying under the direction or the trickery or the influence of the devil? How much of it? the whole world. I mean, what do you notice anything going on in the world that's, that concerns you greatly? No, yes. <laughs> of course you do. What's going on in the Ukraine? I can't help but think that's where most, most Christians are, is in eastern, eastern Ukraine. And guess where Putin was attacking? Eastern Ukraine. He didn't go to Western Ukraine. He didn't go to the central part. Well, that's because Russia is, is this and Ukraine's down here. Nah, eh, I don't buy that either. Why did Armenia get attacked? And then why did our Speaker of the House go and condemn Azerbaijan? Now, you say, well, wait a minute. She has the right to condemn the actions. Oh, I know that. That's not what I'm getting at. But it seems like every day, it seems like all the time we hear something bad. It, it seems like we keep hearing all this stuff. And it just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. Well, the whole world is lying under the sway of the wicked one. But what do we know? What's his goal? His goal, first of all, is to make sure that we do not know whether we have eternal life or not, and whether or not we belong to God. If he can get that doubt established in your heart and in mine, well, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I got eternal life or not. Well, then wait a minute. Go back and do the, do the inventory. I'm not advocating a checklist, but I'm advocating do the inventory. Uh, do you know what the Bible says to do to be saved? Yes. Did you do it? Yes. Are you still doing it? Yes. Like my granny said one time, what's the problem? What's the problem? You know what the problem is. The problem is you're looking at him and her in the mirror every morning. You can't blame this on Satan. You can't blame this on Satan. You can only blame it on, on yourself. Because what he wants to do is he wants us to forget that the Son of God came. He didn't say Jesus. And he's very particular about those three words. The son of God came. 
and has given us a spirit of understanding. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Has, has come and has given us understanding. I, I apologize. That we may know him who's true. That we may know him who's true. And we are in him who is true. In his son, Jesus, what? Christ. Remember the Gnostics said, you can't have Jesus and the Christ. The center said temporarily you can have it. But the man that went to the cross is not Jesus Christ. And John says, that's the man who went to the cross, Jesus Christ. So we know we're in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. And eternal life. Folks, I don't know of anybody that has a bit of sanity in their, in their bodies and in their hearts that doesn't want to have eternal life. If you know of somebody, there was only one guy I ever heard that wanted to go to hell. That was Alice Cooper. And he said, I was high on dope when I said it. I've never heard anybody with their right mind, say, I want to go to hell. If you found somebody, you talk to me about it and share it with me, and I'll give you credit for the story. What we want is eternal life. Because what's going to happen to everybody? Everybody, barring the Lord returns, everybody's going to die. you got a 100% chance of dying. Do I want you to die? No. Do I want you to, to go? No. But it's going to happen one day. I mean, it, a friend of mine said to me years ago, he says, you know, when I was younger, he said, I never read the obituaries. He said, now that I get older, I just want to see if my name's not in it. And he said, you know what's scaring me, Dwayne? I said, what? He says, People that are 20 and 30 years younger than I am are dying. I said, yeah. It's coming to everybody. But the great news is it doesn't have to be eternal death. It doesn't have to be the second death. And that's what John's emphasizing here. This is the true God and eternal life. Eternal life. Now, he makes one little statement here that you kind of look at it first, go with, I don't even know why he put that in there. I mean, why? I mean, I know idolatry, you know, first three commandments and the 10 commandments. Maybe that's where John got the idea. You know, that had to do with idolatry. And maybe that's what he just put it in there for just to, no, no, no. Now, living in the United States today, we do not have idols, correct? I'm going to submit to you the top three idols. And you see if this doesn't ring a bell. Number three is material possessions. The rich young ruler, for example, that was his problem. Jesus never told him. I want to emphasize something because I've heard, heard preachers make the mistake, and I used to make the mistake. When he says, go sell what you have and give to the poor, that's what he said. He didn't say what I have said mistakenly and what I've heard other preachers say, go sell what you have and give it all to the poor. That is not what he said. Well, what, he's, what he wanted to emphasize is, what's got your heart? The possession or me? And what happened? He went away sorrowful because he had many possessions. Do things start decaying as time goes on? Yeah, even human bodies, huh? Number two, money. Money. Jeff Bezos is the, number, is the second richest man in the world at $235 billion. Elon Musk is the wealthiest man in the world at $250 billion. They are well on their way to be the first trillionaires. And the first thing I hear people say when, well, what is he going to do with all that money? 
beats me. Warren Buffett and, and uh, Bill Gates have promised to give, give theirs away. And they've already been doing that because they learned a principle. I don't know if they read it in scripture, but they read a principle that says it's more blessed to give than to receive Acts 20 and verse 35. But I'm still convinced our number one idol is time. I can ask people for material possessions. I can ask people for money. They don't get half as irritated with me as they do time. Well, I don't, what? I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. Charles reminded me of this years ago. He said, we got still 168 hours in a week. Nobody took that away. So why is it we are so, so possessive of time? One of the reasons we're possessive of time is, is because we just go faster and faster and faster. I mean, I've got a, a older fellow in my class and love him dearly, but he just cannot get over the fact that you have to, you have to give these kids this material for over a week. And he looks at me and goes, do you have to repeat this 12 times or eight times? I said, no, 12. <laughs> and he goes, and you keep doing it and you keep doing it and they don't listen and don't pay attention. I said, right. Now, look, my time is my time. That's what people tell me and they get pretty nasty about it. And when I say time, I don't mean that I'm asking for 24 hours a day. I, I'm talking about just a little bit of time. Nope, not gonna do that, not gonna do that. So what do we do with our time? Well, I don't have time to do this, 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 this. Well, when I was a school administrator and I still watch it today as a teacher, I do what I'm supposed to do first. One of the traps I got into was, is that I don't have time. And I began to watch what I was doing with my time. I'd be talking with a student. I'd be talking with a teacher. I'd be talking, 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 talking for about three hours about something. And then all of a sudden, oh man, I don't have enough time to get this done. And I'd watch other administrators and teachers do the same thing. And so I started disciplining myself to say, I got to get this done first before I can do the talking. And I still am one of the few people that leave that building at about 4.15 every day. We get out at four. I have to wait for my stowaway. That's Christopher. <laughs> he gets on a bus and comes down. And then we go home. And people look at me and go, you're already going home? Yeah, I got all, all I'm supposed to do today. And if I didn't get it done today, will it be there tomorrow? Yes. That's another problem. I got to get this done and get this done. I have a friend of mine that used to stay until 8.30, 9 o'clock because he wanted to impress the upper administration. And I'm like, if that's what it's going to take to impress them, forget it. They go home by five. They're not watching you. And he goes, yeah, yeah, but, and he was very good at what he did. Don't misunderstand me. His wife helped him out a bunch. Now, you don't have to agree with me about the, about the time issue, the money, and the material things, but whatever you think of as an idol, we got to keep away from that because an idol is anyone, anything that will keep us from putting God first. And there are things out there. There are things within us that will do that too. It's kind of tough to, to listen to John's words because what we tend to think of an idol is, well, if I set a, if I set a pole right there and, and I had people go by and, and worship it, we tend to think the stuff like what Nebuchadnezzar set up. Those are included. But the first three commandments of Exodus 20 that transferred to the New Testament, don't put anything, anyone, 
or any, any before God. Because God's a jealous God. He does not share. He gets first. He's always first. And John says, oh, I know it's easy. Turn around and tell people, look what I know. Look what I know. When I tell people I don't know anything, I'm sincere in that a lot of times. <laughs> because some things don't matter. Now, for me personally, and there's nothing wrong with knowing things. Don't go home tonight thinking that's what, what we're saying here. But there are things that I like to, I like to know. Uh, my, my wife and kids can't stand it when the State of the Union address comes up because I'm watching. I'm not interested in what Biden's got to say. I'm really not. I'm interested in who comes in at this time, this time, this time. Who's, it, who's the one that got left out? And the first three, first words out of the Dell and kid's mouth is, who cares? <laughs> I, I respect that. But I'm the nerd, see? I'm, I like that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you put knowledge before God, you put me before God, you put you before God, there's the problem. And so he says, keep yourselves from idols. And then that four-letter word, that we say at the end of a prayer, because Jesus said it, it simply means, let it be so, I agree, or we'd say it in 2022, right on. That's what amen means. Let it be so, right on. I totally agree with that. Totally agree. And that's why Jesus would say, you got to work together in your marriage so that your prayers won't be hindered because if you have a problem in your marriage your prayers are worthless they're going to be hindered until you get that problem worked out that's why he says don't go to bed angry and all that stuff sometimes that becomes an idol and he uses that word amen amen let's pray Father, thank you for the time tonight. We just pray that we've used it wisely. And Father, we thank you for what you've entrusted with us, knowledge, because we know things. Father, please bless us tonight as we go home. Keep us safe and in your care. Thank you for all who are here. And we pray for those who couldn't make it tonight. Thank you so much, Father, for the technologies that we have. And Father, we just pray that we can use these to further your kingdom. Please forgive us of our sins. Please keep us safe and in your care. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who guides us. And it's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight.